Hi, welcome to another episode of PH Perspectives. Today I have Lizzie Corcoran from the Beaumont Foundation. Welcome, Lizzie. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. Did you have any questions before we got started? Can you give me like more context of like the CEAS guidelines and like what the um, what all like the podcast or the content like trying to accomplish or who the audience is and like I don't know I, I don't know a ton about it um, and that would be helpful for me maybe you could help me um, okay try to best answer. Okay, perfect. So um, I came up with this idea because I said I had no idea what I wanted to do. But the thing about public health is that it's very broad, so you can do anything, but it's also so broad that sometimes it's, tr it's hard to narrow down what, exactly what you want to do. Yeah. And so what I wanted to do with the podcast is interview um, some professionals in the field. I especially wanted to um, focus on people who are are fairly new. Um, I got my MPH in 2015, so I've only been working in the field for a couple years. So I wanted to get folks who were new to the field and some people who were seasoned in the field to kind of get, you know, just have them tell me their story. Because a lot of times we see these different professions, but in public health, you kind of stumble upon a lot of different things. Like the work that I do here at Wake Forest, I never imagined that I would be doing this with my degree, you know, and it'd be good for, you know, future healthcare workers to hear the stories of other people. So if they have a particular path or particular interest, maybe, you know, they can follow along those. They'll have some guidance, shall I say. Yeah, that is awesome. I, I strongly identify with a lot of things you just said. I'm, so I'm new. I got my MPH in 20, gosh, 17, so in May. Oh, wow, brand new. I, I briefly forgot what year that was. Um, yeah, and I, I would say I had the exact same. I mean, I knew I wanted a MPH because as daunting as it is to enter the workforce with just an MPH, it's also like a bachelor's would be even that much more, you know, that's even more broad with even less technical skills. Right. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I absolutely had that same feeling of feeling very, very, like, I, and I still feel this way, a little bit open to anything. It's like being, like feeling very confused about all the many, many, many directions you could go in in this field and not really knowing the lay of the land and looking for that, like, I don't know, public health generational knowledge and having no idea where to find it. Um, yeah, so that is awesome. I feel like a lot of people would want to listen to this podcast. Um, Definitely, and I read your blog, and I'm, I'm going to put links to your blog post um, whenever we oh. post the podcast, we'll put, you know, links to all your information that is on the Beaumont site. But I did, I forgot which year you got your MPH, but I did read through your blog post about not really knowing what you wanted to do. And I'm like, oh my God, this yeah. is like exactly like what my podcast is about. Like, <laughs> It's amazing. So you are a perfect match. Oh, great. Okay. That, that helps a lot. I was worried that you were thinking I had a lot more experience than I did. <laughs> oh, no. And see, the thing is, is that for me, too, like, I want to hear about people who are at all different positions because yeah. there are a lot of people who just got their MPA just like you who are, you know, still learning the lay of the land or people like me who are even two years in who are still learning the lay of the land, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I would, I, yeah, I would love, I think it's one of my criticisms of school is that, like, they I mean they they focused they got helped us get skills they definitely gave us lots of practical opportunities but there wasn't like this is the lay of the land in public field these are the people of public health there was no like there's no like um I don't know I think just like hearing from the leaders who have shaped the field has been something I wish would happen in school even like teachers didn't even talk about their own experience um, professors who had who were I mean I think a lot of it is because they were a lot of them are researchers and that's why they're in school. And so they teach and they also do research. I don't know. So I've, I I feel like there is no generational knowledge being passed down. There's no, like, this is where public health has been. This is where it's going. The, yeah, I wish there was, like, a storytelling element to public health education. Um, so, yeah, people could get a sense of who, what, when. Right. <laughs> yeah. Anything. Anything, please. We are definitely on the same page. Yes. Um, so. Okay, great. Tell me a little bit about what you do with uh, the De Beaumont Foundation. Yes, yeah, so De Beaumont, um, I'm um, their fellow, and I became their fellow through the Association of um, Schools and Programs in Public Health, ASPBH. They set up these fellowships um, 
there's a, a lot of them are in federal agencies like CDC and Department of Transportation. There's some global ones, but I'm the philanthropy fellow, um, which is set, so I got placed at the De Beaumont Foundation. Um, and so it is, what's exciting about this fellowship is it is really, um, it, I basically, I craft it based around what I'm interested in doing and like what skills I'm interested in pursuing. Um, De Beaumont specifically focuses on workforce development and public health infrastructure. Um, so a lot of our, we're a national funder and a lot of our fund, national funding programs are all about um, how do we shift the workforce, how do we better prepare the workforce in this field that's changing and moving towards population health, moving towards upstream solutions. How do we, what does the workforce need in order to get there? Because, you know, we can't make that happen unless our workforce is ready. Right. Um, which is, it's really exciting because that's not something I would ever have said I was interested in or passionate about um, as a student. But um, I have become pretty fascinated and obsessed with it. Um, uh, so that's a lot of what I do is I focus on workforce development. So, for example, helping with our, we do a national representative survey of the workforce. Mm -hmm. that it hopes will tell us these big things that need to change, what skills does the workforce need, um, what are the big things that help you retain a talented and um, a talented workforce. So a lot of like retention and succession planning with the workforce. Um, so that's our you know survey, but I also, so I kind of do a little bit on a lot of different projects um, or a lot of different programs. I also help out on the Build Health Challenge, which is kind of a, that is a program that's a little bit more focused on community health, and we so we fund sites around the country to um, work on community health programs or projects that are upstream and integrated and rely on data and are local. Um, but that one, our, our big idea with BUILD is to create cross-sector partnerships in these communities and then kind of prove the point that cross-sector partnerships are the best way to address health and change health in an upstream way that, fo you know, you know, focusing on the social determinants, things like that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so even that, even though it is like kind of like a community health program, is kind of trying to prove a concept about this is a good way to approach complex solutions in health. It, you know, partner across sectors, um, go upstream, use data. Um, so uh, that's a, those are the two, the two big ones I focus on the most, but I kind of, I have been jumping around um, and doing like a little bit on a lot of different projects uh, in addition to writing the blog series. Um, so it is, yeah, so the, the fellowship is very, very explorative. Explorative? Explorative? Exploratory. Um, <laughs> exploratory. There it is. Um, super exploratory and definitely really <laughs> based on like what I want to learn. Um, yeah, and that's what's this, is, which it can be challenging because I need to kind of maybe stop jumping around and focus a little more. <laughs> uh, but also super exciting because it means I get to look. I don't know. I've learned a lot about what we were just talking about, like the lay of the land of public health. Who are the players? What are the trends? Like, who has been changing the field and how? Um, I've learned a ton about that. Um, and I think I've, I've done the same. Um, so I came from South Carolina up to Wake Forest Baptist um, last year. And so my boss, he he likes to really develop your skills so that if you do move on, you have these abilities and these talents that you can take on to other jobs. And so here he has me doing a few different things. And honestly, even though the jumping around can get kind of hectic sometimes, I like yeah. it because, you know, it's it's something different. Like um, I, I work in schools a couple of days a week and I coordinate a, a couple of programs and I'm working on the journal. And it's just so great to be able to diversify skills like that and to find leaders who want to do that for the people that they are mentoring. Absolutely. So what all, so the so JPHMP is just one of your pieces that you do? Mm -hmm. I get to do so many different things, you know, and meet so many different people that I know, you know, at a point in time when I'm no longer working with Dr. Justin Moore that I can move on and be successful because he has allowed me to get those skills. Right. It's like, um, so a lot of what I've been thinking about, because I do have to like figure out what I'm going to do after this year's over. I like talk about this like spectrum of public health. So when I went to school, I like worked, I worked in public schools doing like trauma trainings and capacity building for teachers to 
be more, like, implement more racially equitable discipline policies and um, deal with, like, students who have experienced trauma better. So, I like, I come from, like, that very, very direct, like, working in a school, working with people. Um, and so, so this fellowship has been super, super different. And I'm thinking about, you know, what am I going to, going, you know, moving on, like, do I kind of scale back down? Because right, right now I feel like I'm in a very bird's eye view of the field, like very, very removed out in philanthropy. Um, I've been thinking about what are, how could I go back down to like more working more directly with people? And that, that'll probably surface into a blog someday. Um, <laughs> because, um, I think it's such an interesting choice and like your position seems so cool because you get to do a little bit of both. You get to like take a big, big perspective at the, like with a podcast about the field and like new graduates as well as like have this field experience. And I think that's something that is super exciting because I feel like you have to choose one or the other. You have to either do field experience and that's everything you do and you just kind of have a very narrow focus or, you know, you have a very broad focus and you're up at maybe at a national scale doing something up there and people don't get to like combine both, but that's the most powerful combination is when you get to take direct experience and use it to inform um, like higher perspectives. I don't know if I'm communicating that exactly the way I Oh no, I, I completely understand. You, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Good, good. Okay, cool. And so um, I was Did looking... I off topic? I'm sorry. Oh no, no, no you're fine. Um, going along with it, when we, we talk about, you know, maybe, you know, broadcasting public health a bit more or making sure that people know about the field, especially the millennials. Um, I read your sales pitch um, once Dr. Moore sent it to me and I'm like, wow, this is really good because, um, and, and it's amazing too. Like you said, workforce development has become so huge. Um, I stopped by a couple of poster sessions when we went to um, APHA and the CDC had an entire poster about developing the workforce and, you know, they have an apprenticeship program that they have, um, for um, some like new student, I guess, uh, new healthcare workers, or maybe like f- students who are fresh out who want to get some field experience. Yeah. Yeah, like PHAP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. Like, workforce development is kind of like, I think it can be kind of like a last res- or like the first thing to get cut in a health department or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like actually really, really crucial, especially when you look at like the numbers of people who are going to leave or retire in the next like 10 to 20 years. Um, and yeah, so like when I, I don't know about you, but when I graduated, I did not even consider applying to a health department. Like Me either. Like, technically the backbone of public health, right? Like, right. Who is responsible? Oh, the public health department is. Um, like, that is technically the backbone of public health. I, yeah, I didn't even think about it. Like, I don't know if it was, like, because the way I was trained was to think of public health as, like, something that community-based organizations do. Um, but, yeah, I had, like, absolutely no idea of, like, if I want to if I wanna be an influencer in public health in X, Y, or Z ways, uh, yeah, I didn't even consider government. I'm going to be honest, and I don't, I don't, I can't put my finger exactly on why, but I think it's because possibly there's a, like a divorce or a breakdown between like public health departments and recruiting and education, and like there's no there's no pipeline. Yeah, and especially and I think that's probably what PHAP is trying to do. But yeah, I I applied for PHAP, and I'm pretty sure I didn't get it. So. Um, I think that, yeah, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I definitely applied it for PHAP. Um, so, that, yeah, so I, I, yeah, that was my experience with, like, not even considering applying. But, like, now in this position, we focus almost entirely on governmental public health and realizing how important it is to have a strong public health workforce in government is, like, incredible and how, how severely broken down the pipeline is between educating young people and getting them into health departments is like incredibly hard because because of there's just no I mean I think there's a lot of groups that are trying to connect all the dots like ASPPH is obviously CDC looks like they are like but um, overall I mean as a new new graduate in the field I would say that I don't I didn't see much of one I didn't see a window I didn't see an opportunity to get into governmental public health right and I think for me so um, I took the CHES exam, which is a Certified Health Education Specialist. And I think you had taken the CPH exam, correct? 
Yeah, I did. Yeah. So I think I think those things are pretty similar. But um, when I took it, they said that it was going to count for a year of experience on my resume. And, you know, I applied to a few different jobs. But the thing about a lot of the jobs and I think what turned me off from the governmental jobs as well is that they require a lot of experience. And don't get me wrong, experience is necessary, but identifying those criteria, like what type types of experiences do you want this person to have, you know? Yeah, I would agree. I would always like, I'd be like, I would count my school time as experience. I mean, that's partially because I was lucky to do public health work while in school, just like through internships and assistantships. Mm-hmm. But I, I, yeah, I know I remember that. Like, And I also just like the, there's a lot to be said for the process of hiring um, through governmental agencies is like incredibly slow, incredibly difficult. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's like a really slow, difficult hiring process um, that I remember. Cause like, I remember like you would have to like the, when replying or applying to federal or state agencies, like it was a very specific um, like form. And then you wouldn't hear back for a really long time. I don't know. I just remember the process just being like super, disincentivizing and unengaging and slow and difficult and complicated. Um, and the, you know, the job descriptions were sparse and the requirement or the, you know, the experience requirements were a lot more than I had. Um, yeah, no, I, I remember the, the application process in itself can be a, a big barrier, I think. Mm-hmm. And um, I was thinking too, like, even, you know, even in my experiences, and I don't have a lot as far as traveling to conferences and stuff like that. Um, when I was at APHA, I got exposure to a lot of people, including folks who are on the board of JPHMP. And these people have done excellent work for years and years. And I'm actually humbled and then a little bit nervous because I'm speaking to someone who works for Emory or I'm speaking to someone who works for the mm. CDC, you know, and like... Yeah. You know, the ladies poster session about workforce development, like I got to shake her hand and everything. And it was it was kind of an honor. She worked for the CDC and that that used to be kind of one of my one of my dreams. Like it's like the CDC, like, yes, like that's who I want to work for, you know, and and things change. Of course, I I think I want to be I enjoy being in the community much more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I remember I'm also new to like conferencing like so my, I was also at APHA and that was my first I'd never been to APHA before um and I would say yeah like I would think the number of it's, it's kind of like it's been like a reverse we kind of touched on this earlier but like um hearing about like basically more or less like public health heroes and I'm not talking about like idolizing people but like there are like public health heroes there are public health legends and I didn't know who any of them were um like, I didn't know the big names in public health who have done, like, landmark papers or landmark, like, or had fought tobacco or whatever. Right. Um, and then, so I think in this position, that's been a huge learning piece, is just learning who is who, who's done what, um, where are they now, and, like, what are the big marks they've left on the field, and also meeting a bunch of them, and, like, getting to talk about their stories or their, you know, their work history and, like, what they've done in the field. That is a huge learning piece, and I feel incredibly humbled and lucky to, it, feel, it does feel funny because it feels in a reverse, like I feel like I meet people and then discover that they are actually like, right, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, I should have, I totally should have, this should have gone the other direction, I should have definitely known who you were before, like, like, I don't know, like, if you compare it to another field, like, everyone knows who, like, the big monoliths in business are, like, you know, everyone knows who's the Forbes 500, whatever. Um, like everyone, like the, but like I feel like public health doesn't have that. We don't have like, this is who has impacted public health in huge ways. And this is like the institutions they created and work for. And like, this is, uh, I don't know, I would love that. I think, and it, it also is extremely inspiring. Like the amount of um, inspiration and like kind of, you know, person, like helping me set new personal goals for myself that I've gotten out of meeting people and hearing what they've done has been huge. Like it definitely helps like young public health workers reach higher and think, you know, think more in context of like where public health has been and where it could go and like imagine an even bigger future for public health, I think, um, by sharing these stories of people. Um, and I think that would, that would be, I mean, I feel like when I meet people, they're incredibly generous and they, they would definitely want to reach out to new grads or, right. or young students. 
but there, I don't think there's a great way to do that. I don't think there's a there's a way to pass pass that knowledge on or that experience on. Um, and I feel super lucky that I've found a way into a position that lets me um, like get a piece of that or learn learn in that way. And I think that is definitely like what people like. I think I think that's what young students need. I think that'd be super inspiring um, as well as educational. Definitely, yeah. and I know. Um, so with the the editorial board, like these folks have published multiple papers, you Mm -hmm. know, in our journal. And I've probably even used some of the papers for things I've written for school. I wouldn't have known, but to be able to meet an author of a journal that you've, a journal article that you've read, I'm just like, wow, this is who this person is. I know um, I met Dr. Cynthia Morrow and um, I interviewed her and Dr. Lloyd Novick, who's the editor of the journal. And, um, he had put out his new book, which is um, is 21 case studies, and they talked about, both of them, how case-based learning is probably the best for anyone who is going to be entering the field so that they get mm-hmm. that hands-on experience. And, um, like, she, I mean, she was the nicest. And Dr. Novick, you know, very nice man, very quiet man. And it was just, like, amazing the power that was sitting on either side of me, you know? And I'm just like, these people are real. You know, you you have to make it real. That's why the narrative is important. Yes, you have to. Or, like, even, cause how do you even know about JPHMP until coming to Deboma? Like, it, it's a hugely important, effective journal. And, like, it's, yeah, like, the, like, I don't, it's totally possible that I'd used an article from it before, but, like, not even knowing about this journal. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just, like, that seems like a, it just seems like there's a lot of glaring holes and I want to, like, kind of take responsibility for not knowing these things. But it's also, like, if you don't know, you don't know. Mm-hmm. And if no one teaches you, then there's if there's not a great way to know these. Yeah, there's, there's got to be some type of way for this to get passed on. Um, even if it's not, yeah, even if it's not people, like, no, Novik, it, like, but, like, it's like, this is the journal. And this is what it does. This is why people read it. It is important in the field. Things like that. Very needed <laughs> and so um like in your work so far um as far as like being a part of a government agency like what do you think are some good steps to building an effective team like i'm not sure how many people you might work with or how your yeah. team works yeah so actually so technically de beaumont de beaumont's a, a foundation so we're not um we're not a federal agency we're we're a philanthropic foundation um but we do work with a lot of, I guess, ten, actually, no, they're technically nonprofits. Like, we work with governmental membership associations a lot, like NATO and ASTO. Um, but I have, so I have, to your question, I have learned a lot about, um, because that's a lot of, I think, the skills that I've gained so far is, like, how to be a part of a team, mm-hmm. um, how to, basically, just, like, management. How do you manage a team of people who are all working on the same thing, um, who come from a bunch of different organizations, and how do you align their priorities? And how do you get it a very, very like some technical process? Like this is how you communicate with everyone. This is how you set up the weekly um, communication. It, what I would say would be the first thing to like good leadership or good teamwork. Um, like just good, pa- effective pathways of communication, regular communication, um, agenda setting, and then lots of like following up regularly. Um, Especially when people are, um, yeah, like like I said, coming from different organizations. Like, so a lot of our programs that we have at De Beaumont, like none of them are just De Beaumont. They're all we all we partner with other foundations. We partner with ASTO and NATO. Uh, we partner with universities. Um, they're, so they're all none, nothing we do is actually done just by us. They're all big teams of people um, who are putting in input to help create these programs as well as like actually perform them or carry them out in the field. Um, And those are great skills. Those are great skills to learn, especially like um, you say, you know, you don't really know about building the team, but you know about being a part of the team. And I feel like that's, that's important. Like learning how to be a part of a team, especially in public health, because sometimes, you know, there's no need to have 10 different organizations that do the same thing. We can combine resources, you know, collaboration is the key right there. (laughs) Yes, huge. Like, if you're doing something by yourself, like, that should be a red flag. Like, I don't think anyone in public health should ever do things by themselves. 
Um, and we definitely, yeah, so we, um, so I guess what I've learned a lot about is like, so we're technically grant makers. So making grants, um, bringing on grantees, working with them on a peer level, basically, because we're definitely, we don't just kind of like give people money and then like run away from them. Like, we <laughs> work super, super closely with everyone who is a grantee of ours. Um, and then also like when it can be confusing because there can be a lot of us in a, because we do some funding partnerships where basically a bunch of funders all contribute to one program. Um, so you have like all these funders as stakeholders and then you have Diploma that's kind of in the middle convening everyone and then you have the grantees. So kind of managing expectations and managing that in like a, in a very uh, teamwork setting where we kind of position ourselves to work with people rather than like make people work for us. Mm-hmm. Um and that's been really cool to learn about, to learn about the grant-making process as a, as a teamwork process or as a partnering process um, has been very cool. And I really like this style of making grants, not only with other funding partners, but then when we do, when we give grants, partnering with the people that are our grantees um, in a very, very, like, uh, peer way has been a really, really cool process to learn about, to just kind of see how it's done what the relationships are like, um, how do we talk to people has been very, very cool, a very cool way to learn about kind of this angle of public, this grant-making part of public health, which is, of course, is a huge part. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and a huge part of that leadership, too, as you mentioned, and you guys seem to be doing a great job with this, um, you know, making sure you keep your stakeholders engaged and keep all the team members interested and active like that is so important, especially when you have so many different players at the table. You want to make sure that everybody is contributing equally. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking very specifically of our Build Health Challenge. That's the one. I guess I should have. <laughs> that would be easier if I talked in concrete language. Like our Build Health Challenge is the one where we have all these funders from across the country who are the stakeholders. Then to Beaumont, you know, it's technically the original, you know, the original kind of brain behind the Build Health Challenge. And then our grantees are these, you know, these public health departments and hospitals and community-based organizations, like, all over the country. So that, if you look at the big picture of everyone who's involved in the big Build Health Challenge, it's huge. Like, you've got, you know, the funders all the way over here, and you've got the grantees, tons of them over here, and then... You know, there's a whole team in the middle that manages it. There's a technical assistance team. There's an evaluation team. There's a health equity team that does training for all the sites. There's um, a comps team. Like, like, So the picture is huge, and seeing how they all fit together, seeing how we work with grantees, how evaluation and technical assistance and comms work with grantees, seeing how we manage relationships with all the funders, especially, in, for instance, in the strategic planning process, um, which is kind of like trying to chart a long-term vision for this program. Um, that's, that's really what I'm specifically reflecting on when I'm talking about all these, this huge picture of a program, this huge picture of a grant-making process, and looking at how everyone works together and how it's all managed has been an enormous learning piece. Um, and really cool that I, so I've specifically come in on the strategic planning part, as well as helping kick off 2.0 uh, of, of grants or of grantees um so that's i guess it might be more helpful if i specifically say what i'm thinking about um when i talk about that's that's what i've that's the real one of the big pieces where i've learned about like leadership and teams and working together and communicating um yeah that's huge Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all the information. Like, this has been great, but I think this is an awesome one to start off with because we are talking about exactly what you're trying to do and what I'm trying to do, which is educate the workforce. Uh, Yeah. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Lizzie, and we hope you guys tune into the next episode.